I'm going to start with the prayer. Amen. This morning, what we're going to do is complete the discussion, the study that we had regarding this, to this topic of sanctification. Specifically, when we're talking about sanctification, what I would like to direct your minds to is not really the topic in general of sanctification, but more how does sanctification look? Is it observable amongst ourselves? Is it something that's visibly seen? Can you tell when a person is sanctified? Um, also, not just that, but this really leads to an underlying question that I would like to try to help us address, and that is, what's expected of a Christian once they became Christian? When a person becomes a Christian, are all the other Christians supposed to be able to see something going on in that Christian? Is progress expected? Is that what sanctification looks like? Is it someone just became Christian and now we have to watch and see how they change? And these changes, how does that work? What do they need to change? It's, so these two thoughts are linked the sanctification being observable, it, it's difficult for me to put into words, but the setting that we have is there's already Christians, and then there's people who are becoming Christians, and then there's this thing of sanctification. The people who are already Christians, some depending on how they approach this, this topic. Some Christians may not care. Some Christians may not be looking at other Christians to see, okay, he was just converted, he was just baptized, or she. Is, are, are they changing? Did, uh, did they come into the church wearing spiky bracelets and half-shaved hair? Two years down the road, have they changed that? Is that what we should expect being a church. Does, is sanctification expected to, the, the process of it, sanctification, is that expected to, as a person continues in their relationship with Jesus, being a Christian, what are we supposed to expect to observe in their life? So this is what I want to direct your minds to. And last week, we just began to explore the topic of sanctification in a very general way. Mostly what was discussed had to do with the fact that you could be sanctified. What I'm going to do is just abbreviate. We, we know our word is sanctify. You could be sanctified, and then you can sanctify and there's also sanctification. So a person that's converted to Christianity and they are baptized and things like that, we can easily say they have been set apart for holy use by God. They're sanctified. And they can remain in this state. But remaining in this state is sanctification. And we'll discuss that a little bit more today so that it's not so problematic for us. It may not be problematic for us, but what I pointed out is that 
in everyday English language, we don't really treat this phenomenon here when we're discussing, okay, a person just converted, they're perfect. I think there was a time where some of us had trouble with that concept, where I, I know if I use myself in, as an example, I would think, okay, a Christian is converted, that doesn't mean they're perfect, they still have growing to do. But biblically, I think we can say this justifiably, they are perfect, they're perfect at every stage. Uh, sanctifying, that's, it's God who does that, God sanctifies us, and then sanctification is just you're growing as a Christian. Ideally, you become Christian and you continue to progress in that Christian life. You are leaving behind the person who you once were, and you're going into a person who's more like Jesus. And we also briefly discussed some case studies, some examples from the Bible, where you can find people are being sanctified. You, such as people being healed by Jesus. We discussed Jesus. He's, he's more interested in dealing with the sin problem among us. He, he didn't just heal people so that they can be rid of their sicknesses. He healed them, and he was also very interested in the, the ailments, that spiritual ailment that they had, the sin problem. And I think that if we look at both Jesus and the people whom he influenced, which is apparent throughout all four Gospels, that we can see examples, uh, observable examples. They're visible manifestations of sanctification. We can also see it in the Old Testament. You can consider Abraham. Abraham's a very good case study that we can use. If you can think of Abraham in your mind very briefly and just think of all that he went through, Abraham is a very good example of this, this word right here sanctification. Because Abraham, yes, he decided to follow God, but he didn't have all things right. He didn't even have all things right up until very close to some of the last words we read about him in the Bible, because he still needed to be, I guess you could say, formed, molded, tested by God by having him kill his son. So, this is also a curious matter because we can find that during Abraham's sanctification process, he's, he's doing failures. He's committing sins. What's one sin we can think of is very obvious, is that he was already married and then he took another wife. He did this during this process here. So we may get into a little bit of that this morning. What do you do with a person who's sanctified what happens if they commit sin? Are they unsanctified when they do that? It's a, it's a difficult thing to give a direct answer for. I think the best thing we could do before we get into it is to be very cautious. Because what if a person does what Abraham did and maybe not immediately, but later on down the road, they realize, I made a huge mistake. And then they become repentant. But I think sometimes a Christian might be expecting, okay, you sinned, that's a sin, right? And then the person who committed the fault says, I don't see where this is a sin. I think that causes a problem amongst us Christians. Some might be expecting immediate repentance, immediate sorrow or immediate recognition of the, the bad thing. And it may be that the person who committed the fault, whatever it is, the offense, they don't even agree that what was done was bad or was problematic. I think with, when it comes to Abraham, we can see he thought what he did was acceptable. He was following the instruction of his wife. He took another... He even linked it with prophecy. He said, well, this... this is how we can bring about the promised child. So these are things that Christians deal with while they are growing in Christianity. They, mm -hmm. It happens. So what I would like to do is continue 
discussing this by going more specifically into that area of this topic of sanctification. Is it observable? How does it look? What should our expectations be about sanctification amongst ourselves individually and each other as it's observed in our fellowship? What I would like to do is pick up the discussion from the book John, chapter 8, and verse 11. Last week, we spent quite a bit of time discussing that point when a person is converted. And I think we all agree, well, once they're converted, they've been set apart for holy use, so they're sanctified. But what happens to that person after? What Jesus says, go and sin no more, but how does that actually look? How does it work? What does that look like? It's, my approach to this is easy to say, yeah, go and sin no more. But how does that look in practice? And that's what I would like to try to direct our minds to this morning. So here it says, she said, no man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. So here you have two examples of sanctification. One is Jesus himself. He's sanctified. We know he is. And he's telling her, I'm not here to condemn you. And he's also telling, it's a, there's like comfort and a command, what's going on here. He tells her, you're not condemned, and then he educates her, go and sit no more. And in reading about her, I would like to use a quote from Desire of Ages, page 462. We can read about her to see a little bit of what it looks like after this, this thing happened where you're, you've been forgiven of your sin and you've been commanded, go and sin no more. Reading about her, it says, This was to her the beginning of a new life, a life of purity and peace, devoted to the service of God. In the uplifting of this fallen soul, Jesus performed a greater miracle than in healing the most grievous physical disease. He cured the spiritual malady, which is unto death everlasting. This penitent woman became one of his most steadfast followers. With self-sacrificing love and devotion, she repaid his forgiving mercy. In his act of pardoning this woman and encouraging her to live a better life, the character of Jesus shines forth in the beauty of perfect righteousness. So, so far, if you're keeping track of what we're reading, we're getting two examples of a observable sanctification. One from the woman, her reaction to being healed of the sin sickness. Also one from Jesus, because we want to be like Jesus. So like Jesus, we should be wanting to encourage each other to live a better life. And in doing so, the character of Jesus would shine forth. Then continuing to read, it says, While he does not palliate sin... So we should not palliate sin, nor lessen the sense of guilt. He seeks not to condemn, but to save. The world had for this erring woman only contempt and scorn, but Jesus speaks words of comfort and hope. The sinless one pities the weakness of the sinner and reaches to her a helping hand, while the hypocritical Pharisees denounce. Jesus bids her, go and sin no more. It is not Christ's follower that, with averted eyes, turns from the erring, leaving them unhindered to pursue their downward course. So that's important. If we want to be like Christ, then we shouldn't just ignore someone that's heading to sinful destruction. It says, Those who are forward in accusing others and zealous in bringing them to justice are often in their own lives more guilty than they. So then here's a description of how this could be unbalanced. You can be forward in accusing others like they were with the woman and zealous in bringing them to justice like they were with the woman who was adultering, who was caught in the act of adultery. I'll say it better. 
And it says that people like this are often in their own lives more guilty than they. Men hate the sinner while they love the sin. So we have to be different in that approach. We have to love the sinner and hate the sin. And that would change how you deal with the sinner. It says, we'll continue, it says, Christ hates the sin but loves the sinner. This will be the spirit of all who follow him. Christian love is slow to censure, quick to discern penitence, ready to forgive, to encourage, to set the wanderer in the path of holiness, and to stay his feet therein. So we have examples there of what the Christian, what spirit the Christian would have in dealing with sinners. They should be slow to censure, quick to discern penitence, ready to forgive, to encourage, to set the wanderer in the path of holiness, and to stay his feet therein. And this is a little bit different than some of the comparisons we were making last week. Those comparisons mainly were between the Pharisees and Jesus, or the person that Jesus was helping out. For example, the Pharisees weren't happy when Jesus went to eat with the publicans. And there's a difference there, because the Pharisees have this prejudice, some sort of discrimination against these publicans who need help. They need to have that sin problem addressed. And Jesus is doing that work. So we do, in, in that case, we don't want to be like a Pharisee. We would want to be like Jesus. Or in the case of a Sabbath healing, I think we may have mentioned the healing on the Sabbath. But you could take any healing that Jesus did, that the Pharisees were closely watching him, and see a comparison between the character of the two, between the Pharisees and between Jesus, or the person that he was healing. There was the demoniacs. He healed them, and we found that they, the change it had over them, it put them in their right minds. They were back to a, a normal state of mind. So it's, we mostly use that, if you remember, to, as an example of, okay, a person has been healed of their sin problem, and now they're in a sanctified state. So if you're talking about the Gadarenes, some of, well, probably many of the demons that possessed them, they were put into the herd of pigs. Mm -hmm. And the people in that country asked Jesus to leave. So there's comparisons that you can make between what sanctification looks like and how Jesus is dealing with people and how those people respond, as well as how other people respond to the thing that Jesus is doing. And I think it's important for us to note that the Pharisees are giving us an example of behavior that is not sanctified. We are not supposed to, as Christians, be walking around condemning or criticizing. To say no criticism is a little bit risky for me because we do have to encourage each other. We have to build each other up. There's criticism involved in that. But there is a way to criticize when your motive is wrong. There's a way to do it that's selfish, that is void of any love that you actually have to each other. And that's what we need to try to avoid. Jesus was doing it in a way that was very effective, and it worked. He was merciful. He was patient. He wanted to deal with the people's sins, their sin problem. And I think we need to closely study how he did it, because in our observable history as Seventh-day Adventists, we show that we don't know how to do it, and we've been doing it wrong. What we have shown is that we have used, we could say there's no blame on us. The church was already bad before some of us were even born. So whatever your circumstances are in that matter, we could use what has happened ever since 1863 up until 1957 and say, well, we were hopeless to begin with. 
Maybe that's true. We could say that's what we've been given, that's what we use. We've come into a system that's already messed up. How could we have possibly gotten it right? However you treat that, we know now that the way we've done it before was more, if you're a conservative Seventh-day Adventist, it was, it was more similar to that spirit's, if not completely identical to the Pharisees who were just walking around seeing if you were keeping all of the observances. This problem continues, if you think about it, it continues after Jesus dies. You have the Jews who are Christians, and then you have people who aren't Jews who are being converted to Christianity, and the Jews are expecting these people to keep Jewish observances in some cases. So old habits die hard, I guess you could say, but this in itself is also an example of sanctification. The Jews had things that they did for such a long time. I guess since I'm pointing to the board so much, I should write something that's visual. We have um, the old ways. And then you have progress. I'll just leave it like that. So the Jews had their old ways and they become Christian and they're expected to make progress, but they still have some things that are old that are bothering them through this progress, which you could also say is their sanctification. It's how they continue to grow as Christians. So we're dealing with that too. Today we have recently learned we need to be making progress. We we can see that our focus has been on things that aren't even relevant to the prophetic test of today. We can see that the way we were in the church of being so critical of each other, requiring behaviors of each other, defining Christianity as, well, by our actions. We may not have spoken it by our words, but by our actions we define Christianity as just really doing works, uh, keeping things, keeping observances. We can see that we have done that to an extent that we are now regretful of or repenting of that. And I want to make this point that sanctification, that's what it looks like. You, you discover things as you progress in your relationship with God that were actually, you didn't know were even wrong to begin with. And you're expected to overcome those things. Amen. And think of how it is that God worked with you through that. You may have gone 10 years as a Seventh-day Adventist, walking around criticizing people of how not Adventist they were being based on what things they were doing or what they weren't. And it's not until 10 years that you come to discover you were wrong for doing that. That it's not the way Jesus would have done it at all. So consider that. It's your sanctification process. And just in that example itself, you were wrong for 10 years in how you were dealing with your fellow Adventists. It could be argued that's not true. That, that doesn't happen. But I think it's observable in our history. We have... 1863 to 1888, where things could have been set in such a right fashion that the Seventh-day Adventists could have actually been used to bring about the end of the world. But they didn't. And then you have many more years after that. There's 1888 up until, if we just say 1989, that's... That's about 100 years, isn't it? There's 100 years where God is, what is God doing? I think it's observable to see that whatever he's doing, he's mercifully dealing with his people. He's not demanding of them a quick, immediate response. That is ideal, but we can see that the way that God works with people isn't, 
it just doesn't always happen that way. It's not always immediate. And it's observable in our own Seventh-day Adventist history that God has been patient with us as a, as a group, as a church. So, when Christians are making progress amongst each other, I think we should also see, well, if God does it, if he is patient, he's long-suffering, merciful, we need to keep that in mind and mix that into how, however our criticism toward each other manifests. Our interest should be in keeping each other's minds focused on the, the prophetic issues that are at hand today. Keeping each other focused on that work that we have to do, that we're being prepared to do. And in doing so, there may come circumstances where we have to be critical of each other. And I just encourage you all to be eager to do that, but be careful. Because we do love each other. We would like for all of us to be successful in this endeavor that we're, that we're trying to be useful to God in bringing about the end of the world and save people from the sin problem. And I think if we work together in that, that sort of way, that it would actually work. That we could do this in a way that we don't come off as just being pharisaical, critical for no reason. But just keep in mind you have to do this the way that God has treated you in your life. And I think we have, if we took time to talk to each other of how God has dealt with us, that we'd have many stories to share that show it is observable that the way Jesus did things as we read it in the Bible, that is how it's supposed to be. We're supposed to take that merciful approach, not the pharisaical I'll just leave it as pharisaical. It's a very hasty approach. I could say that. Because there, there is that tendency in the old ways of Seventh-day Adventism where you see, okay, this person's eating pork. He, was, he just baptized yesterday. He's eating pork. You go and tell him you need to stop eating pork. He doesn't eat pork. Then you're talking to the pastor saying this person's not eating. He didn't stop eating pork. Then the pastor has to deal with this problem. They kick the guy out of church because he doesn't eat. I don't know if that's the right way to execute church discipline. Okay. So just keep that in mind. That's really the point of what we're trying to look at today. Now that we've touched on this person who was told to go and sin no more, while we're on this subject of, okay, this, a person is just converted, when is the last time any of you talked to a Seventh-day Adventist who is not a priest? Was it recent? Mm -hmm. Okay. So is, do we only have one example in the room right now? Face-to-face -face talking? Yeah, face-to-face -face talking. Okay, here's the next challenge. We're going to try to whittle down uh, the, what's the word, the requirements. Okay, so you may have talked to one recently. Were they actually honestly interested in the prophecies and the things that we're talking about? No one? Okay, so I can only use myself as an example then. The most recent time I talked to one was a couple months ago, and they actually do express interest in the things that we discuss in our movement. They want to know, they haven't committed to the message or the movement, so they're still living their life the way it is. But they want to know what's happening in the world. They want to know what to expect. They have an honest interest in it. And these Adventists, they have questions that have nothing to do with our prophetic message. But they're questions that are important to them. For example, 
as was discussed this, this morning, music. So the music, we can look at it from our perspective. We could say our message has nothing to do with music. Though if you wanted to be prophetic, symbolic about it, I don't know if any of you have ever done a study on what music represents in the Bible. I think, I could be wrong, but I think you could say when you're giving the midnight cry, you're singing. It's pro mu music tends to be related to prophecy in the Bible. So we, we would look at it that way. We're like, okay, what does the music mean? And we, we could easily just deal with it as, oh, it's prophetic. It's just, it just means we're prophesying music. But does that mean we should neglect the fact that you could actually literally use music to prophesy? What if we put one of the things that we commonly discuss, say, one of the interactions between the king of the north and the south. What if we put how we're expecting, what if you take what we're expecting in November 9 and Panium and you put that into a song and you sing it? Song tends to, you know, hit the memory in a way that people just remember easier. Mm -hmm. So you could be singing this doctrine, this prophecy that we discuss in a way that actually is more efficient in certain aspects. A person will remember by song. If the song has a good melody and a good rhythm, it'll enhance the effect that it has on a person remembering what was discussed, the message that's in the song. While I'm hitting this topic of music, we as priests, we should look at music if you're in this converted state of mind, your approach to music will be with your higher powers in control of the lower nature. So music, this is a, it's a natural thing. Before you have Satan, even, we know God makes music. It's a creation of God. Music has rhythm. Drums or not, there is rhythm in music, even if there are no drums. God created rhythm. Music, imagine if sin had never been a problem on earth, would we have never had music? We would have, and the music would have always been used correctly. And the music we can see, it's observable in humans. The music, it has a response in humans. But some music will, will um, influence a human to move to the rhythm. Now, in the Bible, it's observable that there was dancing. The dancing that they did, I'm pretty sure, was not the sort of dancing where you would be, where the focus of the dance would be on the sexuality of either the man or the woman. But no matter how you slice it, when you have a human body moving in interesting ways, a person will have an opinion, a person who's observing the dancing, they will have an opinion. The opinion that they have ranges on a spectrum that looks foolish to that's very impressive and everything in between. So we as priests should be in a place where we look at music kind of the way that Brother Roman was, I think, trying to emphasize that we should look at it with our higher powers. We should be able to see the message that's in the music, if it has anything to do with proving or... I'll just leave it at proving because that's what we're looking for these days. We're looking for prophecy coming to pass. We want to see that the things that are being taught, that they're actually visible around it, they're happening. And we want to see that there's this crisis that people are dealing with where there's people who are oppressed, and then there's people who are wanting to take, use governmental power to maintain that oppression. And we want to see this happening on a worldwide, international scale. So we should be able to look at the music, or listen to it, and with our higher powers in control, not be influenced by the music but be able to discern, is there anything that 
lens to our prophetic story that we're proclaiming. The person who isn't converted, they're pro they, will, they will tend to listen to music with the lower nature. They might miss the point of the song altogether. And this is, I think, part of the mixture of truth and error in music today, is that you will have a person who may be honest-hearted. Not all music comes from mainstream media who there could be a conspiracy theory said about it that it's the mainstream media is actually into the occult and they require you to get naked and do secret rites before you even do a song. You, even if you have that mentality to it, not everyone gets involved in all that stuff. Not all musicians get involved in that. Some musicians aren't very popular and they themselves will go make some sort of a song that's a very political message, something that's crying out, hey, the world has problems. And they will prevent people from getting that message by the music that's around the song. The music might be very uplifting, which would not match the message of the, of the song. Or the music might encourage dancing and things like that, and people just think, oh, that's so cool. And they might go five years before they realize, oh, this person's talking about society. So these Seventh-day Adventists, when, let's say we start talking to them, and they actually exhibit an honest interest in the things that we're talking about. They want to commit their life to it. They're going to have these questions, these questions that we probably don't think about much today, things that we just treat as, oh, that's not our message. We're not really caring about what a person is eating or wearing or listening to in music. We just want them to see how near we are to the end of the world, to understand how it's going to happen. And if they decide to commit their life to that, great. God will lead them. And somehow we also, because that's how God works, he works through us. We're also going to be involved in raising them up. And part of this raising of a newborn baby will deal with these things. Things like, should my eating habits change? Should my dress habits change? Should my music habits change? Say the person listens to gospel music. Because they're already, if we use an example, they're already a conservative-minded Christian. Not too conservative, where they can't handle drums and the only music that they have in their life is hymns. But they're more conservative-minded. They, they have an honest interest in being a true Christian. Say they, they get exposed to this message and they say, okay, so what do we do with music? Do you guys use music? What, what is the conclusion on music? So what would we do for them? Do we just say, don't worry about it, there's more important things going on right now? You could. You could do it. You could honestly do that. If you wanted to be that, I'm a very logical person. I tend to take that sort of approach. Where you could, okay, it's better safe than sorry. Just leave it alone till the end of the world. You'll, you'll be fine. That might work. But I also know a person who, since they were in, I don't really know them anymore, but I knew of them at one point. Since they were in their mother's womb, their parents would play music. And they just made this person into a very musical person. And music was such a big part of their, that person's life, for their whole life. And they were a young person, so they didn't have too much life. But it was important to them for their brief less than 20 years at the time that I knew them. It was so important to them, and then they expressed interest in this message. And they wanted to know what to do with the music. At the time, I took the logical approach. I said, our church can't handle music. It's best to just not use it. If we don't know how to use it, we better not use it and focus on this prophetic message. And you'll get to a point where you will have music and it will only be used properly. right?" Because there's this concern 
in the meantime, while we're here on earth, until we get to heaven. That's what I was trying to lead the person's mind to. It's, there's risk involved. We don't really know. You, do you know how to? You're asking me. So you obviously don't know how to deal with music, and I don't either. So this is the best I could do for you. And like I said, that may work for some people. But this person, music was such a big part of his life that that wasn't satisfactory. Mm. So, and you could see in his behavior how it was really hurting him. His, he wanted to express himself in music. And this can be done. Mm -hmm. Music, God made it. You, you can use music to worship God. You could use, imagine if the mainstream media didn't monopolize music. What if the world was different and music was actually monopolized by Christians? The sort of music we'd have would be things like singing about the end of the world, singing about the joys of being saved. I think the world would be a different place if that was even a reality. I think the world probably would have ended. But music has a use. And it's part of this, it's not really the focus of sanctification, but it's part of it. So we as a church, we have an old way of dealing with music. And it's not even so important in regards to this prophetic message. It's not our test. But what do we, I, I'm just using it as an example for when people start asking us, if they express genuine interest in this prophetic message and they decide to commit their lives to it, when they bring up these things that we don't really talk about, what, what do we do? And I think just in regards to music and any other thing that they might bring up, the best I could tell you right now is just be careful. What you tell them is you exerting your influence on them. And you're, the influence you exert could have profound effects down the road. You could tell them something, say if I was to tell them, yeah, the church doesn't do music rights, but you can listen to whatever you want. And they go and do that. And by listening to whatever they want, they go out of gospel music and into whatever they want to listen to. And something they hear in one of their musics actually is like a seed of doubt. And then they don't remain in the sanctification. They just leave. It may not be as profound as that. What if some, the way you influence them down the road, they tell a person the same thing. And they might stay in the sanctification, but the other person they tell, it, it's like a stumbling block to them. And when they were once interested in listening to this prophetic message that we have for them, now they aren't. Now they think, oh, you guys are just a bunch of, like, Christianity for you guys is nothing, I guess. It's just like being where I'm at in the world. And people who aren't even Christian, they have expectations of, they don't know that it's called sanctification, but these people who aren't Christian, at times, their expectations of what a Christian should be are... Sometimes they're actually more correct than some things that the conservative Adventists believe about it. But oftentimes, also, they're right in line with that conservative way of thinking, because Christianity sometimes is viewed by others as it's a conservative thing. So how we deal with things like that, we have to be careful. I don't really have a solution for it. But I kind of hope it doesn't happen in our very close view. I hope that people come join the movements and just by the circumstances of what's going on, maybe they won't be worried about those things. Like, okay, should my diet change? Should my dress change? Should my whatever habits change? 
but I don't, I don't know if we can safely say that we're not going to have to deal with that. So that's kind of the purpose in looking at sanctification, because this is what happens. There's these expectations that come along with the conversion. What does a Christian look like? What, what sort of, what is the progress that the Christian is making look like? Okay, so the next thing I would like to do, since our time is winding down, is look at a few things from the book Desire of Ages. Or not Desire of Ages, Steps to Christ. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Steps to Christ. What I'm going to do is read a few things from the chapter Growing Up Into Christ. The first one I'll read is on page 50, and it's paragraph 2. This question may not necessarily be for us, but I think it shows observable sanctification. It says, Do you ask, how am I to abide in Christ? In the same way as you received him at first. As ye have therefore received Christ, Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. The just shall live by faith. So these are two quotes uh, from Colossians 2.6, uh, as you have received them, so walking in him, and from Hebrews 10.38, the just shall live by faith. And then it continues, you gave yourself to God to be his holy, to serve and obey him, and you took Christ as your savior. You could not yourself atone for your sins or change your heart, but having given yourself to God, you believe that he, for Christ's sake, did all this for you. By faith, you became Christ's, and by faith, you are to grow up in him. By giving and taking, you are to give all, your heart, your will, your service, give yourself to him to obey all his requirements, and you must take all, Christ, the fullness of all blessing, to abide in your heart, to be your strength, your righteousness, your everlasting helper, to give you power to obey. So there's this interesting thing going on here. As humans or even if you don't consider humans, we could compare humans and plants. Plants, they are alive because they take nourishment. Humans, we continue to live because we also take nourishment. We eat uh, water and food. We take those things, our body metabolizes them, gives us energy, we continue living. We, none of this is something that we could do on our own. We can't maintain life. The, that we have life is God-given. And so God uses, it seems, this phenomenon to represent the spiritual life as well. So we know lots about the literal life. And what we find is that it actually works the same in your spiritual aspects of life. Spiritually, to be a Christian, you have to get nourishment. You, you need... The point of what I'm trying to say is only God gave you your actual life. And your spiritual life can only be given to you by God too. That happens... You know, you... You're convicted of sin, you're repentant, you convert, you get new life. That's, that's God-given. And that's maintained also by you continuing to partake of that relationship with God. So just like... In reality, in your physical body, you need nourishments, you need something that keeps you alive. It works the same in the spiritual realm. You, it's God that actually keeps you spiritually alive. And you have to take this by faith. It's, it's not something that we of ourselves can do. We cannot be Christian by our own efforts. So continuing on, I want to read the next reference from Steps to Christ, page 51. And this is starting on the last, par last paragraph on that page. This starts to get into, if you're sanctified, what happens, how do you maintain that sanctif sanctification? Can you possibly fall out of it? What, what happens? So here it reads, When the mind dwells upon self, it is turned away from Christ, the source of strength and life. 
Hence, it is Satan's constant effort to keep the attention diverted from the Savior and thus prevent the union and communion of the soul with Christ. Okay, so here we see you're, if you're sanctified, you now have this adversary who's going to persistently be trying to distract you from maintaining the communication that you must have to remain sanctified. The pleasures of worlds, uh, this is Satan's tactics, the pleasures of the world, the life's cares and perplexities and sorrows, the faults of others. So here you have the Pharisees. Pharisees were looking at the faults of others. So doing that, some of this is what plagues conservative Seventh-day Adventism. You, as a Christian, you go around looking at the faults of others. And you think in doing this, you're helping them. You say, okay, this person, he's still eating pork. He was just baptized. So I'm going to talk to him, tell him to stop doing it by tomorrow. And then you are just watching him closely. You see him sneaking some pork out of the fridge. Say he's your roommate. Then you say, oh, you just ate it again. I'm going to have to tell the pastor about this. Meanwhile, that person is probably feeling somewhat oppressed. And doing stuff like that is, how, how did it read? Satan uses the faults of others. Even your own faults and imperfections. So this could be completely personal. You could focus so much on your own faults, imperfections, to where that becomes uh, selfish, not really sanctified. It could, it could be misused. It can be taken to an extreme that actually cuts off your communication with God. To any or all of these, he will seek to divert the mind. Do not be misled by his devices. Many who are really conscientious and who desire to live for God, he too often leads to dwell upon their own faults and weaknesses. And thus, by separating them from Christ, he hopes to gain the victory. We should not make self the center and indulge anxiety and fear as to whether we shall be saved. So there could be an accusation raised against us. We believe, oh, we're sanctified. We, we take that prophetically and we say, we're perfect, we're perfect at every stage. And someone can come against us and say, you're preaching, you're doing what Ellen White says not to. You're saying, oh, you're saved. Ellen White says, no one will ever say they're without sin. Do you know what quotes I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. So there's, you will, we will say this based on our prophetic message, and then people will speak out against us using Ellen White. They, I would like to say they are being Pharisees. But they might be like Paul. They, there's cases, I'm sure, where they honest-heartedly think they're doing right. And it may not be until two years down the road where they learn otherwise. So we have to be patient with them. If, if at all possible, we would take that opportunity to teach them the right way to use the reference they're taking from Ellen White. Also, you can see here what Ellen White is saying, that you can actually take comfort in your salvation. We're not claiming that we're going out without sin, but the way it says here is, we should not make self the center and indulge anxiety and fear as to whether we shall be saved. All this turns the soul away from the source of our strength. Commit the keeping of your soul to God and trust in Him. Talk and think of Jesus. Let self be lost in him. Put away all doubts. Dismiss your fears. Say with the Apostle Paul, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Rest in God. He is able to keep that which you have committed to him. If you will leave yourself in his hands, he will bring you off more than conqueror through him that has loved you. And I'll continue reading the next paragraph. It says, When Christ took human nature upon him, he bound humanity to himself by a tie of love that can never be broken by any power, save the choice of man himself. So here you have 
choice is a factor here. When you're sanctified, you either choose to remain connected to the vine, connected to Christ, or you choose to disconnect yourself. And Satan is going to use, he's going to attack this, this thing. He's going to entice us to exercise our will in favor of the lower nature of sin, of the old life before you were converted. So let me see. It says Satan will constantly present allurements to induce us to break this tie, to choose to separate ourselves from Christ. Here is where we need to watch, to strive, to pray, that nothing may entice us to choose another master. For we are always free to do this, but let us keep our eyes fixed upon Christ, and he will preserve us. Looking unto Jesus, we are safe. Nothing can pluck us out of his hands. In constantly beholding him, we are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So to close this up in the last few minutes we have, I would like to talk about the disciples, maybe a few of them. The point of all this is to check out what sanctification looks like. Okay, I think, I don't know if we all agree that in this sanctification process, the progress that a Christian is expected to make, I don't know if we're at a point where we can all agree, yes, a person who is at this point and they had habits that were bad either to their health or to their fellow men, they should be overcoming those habits as they go. I don't know if we're at an agreement on that. I think in general we are. But here's the problem. The way these habits, they may, things, they, they may be things that aren't sinful until another person gets involved. It could be a, when we're dealing with stumbling blocks, right? You could have a habit that doesn't harm anyone, no one cares about, but then you join the church and then there's people in the church who, when they see you doing that habit, they have problems with it. For whatever reason. There's various reasons that we could have problems with each other. And I'm not going to go into those reasons. But when you get into that situation, I don't know if we're all willing to agree that, then yes, that person has to be careful with that habit that they do, at least for the sake of their fellow Christian who has trouble with that thing that they do. Th that's the challenging part of sanctification because as we are all working together toward the, soul, the same end goal, we are either not caring about each other and our progress or we are in some kind of a middle ground where we're thinking, well, we should be making progress but I don't know what it looks like, or I, I think we should have been over some such thing by now, but we aren't, and I'm just not going to touch it because I don't want to get people mad. Or you'll be on this other extreme where you see something and you just immediately call it out, right? Because as human beings together interacting with each other, we have expectations of each other. And then when you put religion in the mix, it really complicates things because we have a lot of these old ways that right now we may see they were wrong, but I think what we're dealing with today is just like the Jews back in that time with, you know, before you even get to 100 AD. The Jews are still putting some pressure on Christian converts to do old ways. So I think we're still to a degree dealing with the old ways and trying to figure out how we carry that into our experience now. So there may be some of us who are looking at another expecting sanctification to work a certain way. And yes, we can say well, you shouldn't be doing that. That's pharisaical. 
But what if it isn't pharisaical? What if the person is just honestly looking for how to be Christian? They're not really looking for fault-finding purposes. They're just wondering, what, how should I behave as a Christian? I think that's where we just have to be careful. And it's a very challenging thing. I don't have some sort of perfect answer to how we deal with sanctification as it's observed amongst each other. But I, I think we can look at examples such as Peter. Uh, we'll just take Peter and then we'll close. There, there's cases where we could look at Peter and prophetically we could treat him as exemplifying either righteousness or wickedness. But if you take him just in his, his own literal story, God was working on Peter throughout his whole experience there, even after he denied Christ. When Jesus came to ask him to, what is it that he asked him before he said, feed my lambs? Do you love me, I think? Yep. Peter, he was, it's as if that thing, that his failure where he denied him, that it was being addressed. See, God was still working on Peter. The difference is that Peter, he, he was, he's being sanctified. He's spending time with Jesus. But we know he still has faults in his character. These, these are things... This battle, it never ends. When, once you're converted from now until you die or until the world ends, you're, you're always going to have to be dealing with overcoming, making progress. And you can see this as it's exemplified in Peter's life. Peter, he has character faults and all that, and you, then you get to the point where he actually denies Christ. And we can easily say, that's a sin. So what happens to Peter? Is, is he now all of a sudden lost? Is he out of sanctification? Is he not sanctified anymore? I don't really know how to answer those things, but I do know that there's a key difference with Peter versus someone else. Yes, Peter willingly chose to deny Christ. He was under pressure. He just couldn't handle it. Should have done better. We could say that easily. Put yourself in the same situation and really think about that because I think we're coming to a point where we will be put in Peter's situation. Uh, it's, we're expecting that in the future, right? So he fails and he commits a sin there. What's, what's the difference with him versus a person who's not even converted? Peter fails and he immediately... Maybe we can't say immediate, but we know he is regretful. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want to remain in that failed state. He wants to get back to this. And he seeks that out, and he gets comfort when he sees that Jesus has, accepts him, that he has, a, he has this assurance, yes, he can be forgiven. He can remain sanctified, reserved to Jesus. The technicalities of it, whether he somehow fell out and he's not sanctified anymore or things like that, I don't really know how to deal with. But what I do know is you can make mistakes here in your sanctification and you can either just leave it all behind. You can choose to not continue to make progress. Or you can make mistakes and be like Peter. You still have your heart is actually with God. You, your purpose in life is to live for God and not for yourself, things that you want, achieving your goals on earth, things like that. Do you understand what I'm saying there? It's, you can also consider William Miller, whom we, we could read from the spirit of prophecy that he's going to be resurrected as righteous. But we know he sins by rejecting prophetic truth, advancing light, back in his day. In his case, you can see, maybe like Peter, his, his heart is set on God. Yeah, he may have rejected truth. 
but how does God deal with us? And we see Jesus, who is still being merciful with Peter, encouraging him to feed his lambs after Peter admits that he loves him, that, that whole dynamic there. The point that I'm making is, yes, as we're being sanctified, we may come to a point where we make mistakes. But we, we have to stay interested in the work that God is doing now. It may be things that aren't even necessarily sinful. It could be like me. I may have made a mistake with that person about the music because they're, they're not even in the message anymore as far as I know be, with, because of my hard approach to saying just drop it and stay focused on this, this message. He could have blended music with the message. I didn't offer him that idea. There's things I know now that I didn't know then. So it could be things like that. You, you might have made mistakes that may not even necessarily be sinful, but the thing is, as a Christian, you're making progress. And I don't think we can say that we're just going to know perfectly how to deal with every single circumstance in our future from the point we're conver converted to beyond. So we have to rely on God and our hearts have to be set on the work that we have to do today. And just to give a closing thought, since we're talking about this, this matter of making mistakes and you're being sanctified, this will also come from First uh, John. First John chapter 2, verse 1. There's more to the context of this if you read other verses, but this is the thought here. He says, My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Okay. So, that's, this is what we're doing. Yes, there's going to come a point where we no longer have an advocate. But are we there yet? So just keep that in mind. While we're in this period of time and we still have an advocate, and there may be some uncertainty on how we deal with close probation and all these things, let's try to take advantage of this time to live sanctified lives. The sanctification, I guess my overall point, is that it doesn't look like all of us being together and being critical of each other, making sure we're all keeping, maintaining order and requirements of a religion. It doesn't look like the pharisaical approach. I hope that you could see from what we discussed and how Jesus dealt with people, how he healed people, the effect that he had on them, how they lived their lives afterwards. I hope you could see from those things, those are examples of what sanctification looks like, visibly observable. Also, you have the fact, you can observe in our own, me the history of our message, sanctification, from a little bit of a different perspective, because it's more dealing with the actual testing message for, for our time, which seems to take for granted. You're conservative, you already know these things, good habits, good diet, you, you know how to be a Christian, but there's things that you're missing still, and that's the truth that's been revealed to us over time since 1989. You could take how God has actually revealed that truth. He didn't give it to us all at once. I think we can trust that what He revealed and when He revealed it, when it comes to us to test us, that was all deliberately calculated by him. We're dealing with things, issues of, you know, social inequality and things like that now, because probably we couldn't have handled it back then at 9-11. Maybe. I don't know. 
but I know that there's some sort of purpose in it. So the sanctification, I hope you can see, is it's not this way we would have seen it from the old ways, the, the way the church was before. The church, the SDA church still discusses sanctification and they still, it, when they do it, it tends to become a great conversation anytime it happens because there's a lot of disagreement in it. There's, there's a lot of misunderstanding on what sanctification even means. People will focus more on that it's a process. Some people will say that it's a, a, an instant thing and then this causes heartache amongst themselves because they have trouble dealing with the word itself. There's, so my overall point Really, uh, I hope that what we've discussed these past two Sabbaths has shown us sanctification amongst each other. It, that we have to be careful about it. I think it's worthwhile to study and investigate. And that it doesn't look like what maybe we thought it was before. So... Sanctification is not to look at the color of another person's hair and say, well, I thought they were Christian. It's not to look at what a person's... Let's, let's mention physical adornment in general. Sanctification is not to be a Christian and look at what people, how they're adorning themselves and use that as some sort of a measuring tool to measure are they sanctified or not. Instead, sanctification is a process where we're, all of us, we're overcoming our old things. All of us are different. We don't really come from the same background. Some of us may be more conservative-minded than others. Some of us may not. So there's going to be differences amongst ourselves where if we were to take some sort of a measuring tool, it would be coming from our own background. And this may not always work well with each other. But there, I think there are things that we could take from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy regarding what progress a Christian is supposed to make, how it happens, and how we're supposed to deal with each other as it happens. And that's all I'm trying to encourage us to do, to just look at sanctification in a more careful way, a way that's more, it resembles more of the way that God deals with us. And we know that time is short now, so we can't say, well, the sanctification, it may happen over 10 years, you may never get over that thing. Because that is, you could take what I'm trying to say to an extreme, I suppose. But time is short, and what I trust is that God is going to work with us according to the time. We just have to be willing to let Him change us, right? Amen. So, in doing that, we also have to work with each other and exhibit the same characteristics that He does. The long-suffering, the patience, mercy... And, yeah, if, I don't know where this discussion on sanctification will go in the future, maybe nowhere, but if you have any ideas to share or anything like that, if you think that something I discussed or mentioned was not really in agreement with what your expectations are, just let me know. But what I am, I am pretty confident that the sanctification as we see it observed in Jesus' life and how he influenced others is different than what conservative Seventh-day Adventism, even liberal Seventh-day Adventism, they take it to another extreme. It's different than both of their perspectives on it. It's a, it's a work in progress, the sanctification. And I, it's nice to see that how God deals with us in that sanctification is like he dealt with Peter. 
so just, I'm not saying that we could go past a close of probation. When we get to Jacob's time of trouble and there's no intercessor, that's one thing. But what I'm talking about is right now, especially now, because we do have 11.9 as a close of probation. It's a symbolic prophetic one. And I think it would be good of us to just continue to be careful with each other as we continue on in this work of the last days that we've all committed our lives to doing. And that's it. I will go ahead and close with, do we close the prayer first and then sing? Okay, we'll close with prayer. Gracious Father, we would like to come before you to thank you for the time that we were able to spend in worship this morning, for the time we were able to spend with each other. We would like to ask that you please continue to guide us and give us discernments, right, proper discernments in how we deal with each other and how we understand these topics which at times might seem so basic, but because of our upbringing in the church, we either have a twisted view of them or we don't know how to deal with them at all. We would like to deal with the matter of sanctification in the same way that you deal with us. We would like to deal with it with each other in that way. We want to be like you as, as you've embodied all the commandments and do unto others as you would do unto yourself. But we also would like to maintain the integrity of Christianity, what it means to be your follower. So we would like to ask for your guidance in this matter. We are a new church, recently separated from people whom we once thought were trustworthy guides. And now we're finding that we never really had a trustworthy guide at any point in our Seventh-day Adventist history. So we would like to ask for your continued assistance in helping us to know how to deal with these subjects, especially because we are not certain of the future, how we may have to deal with the Levites. Will we deal with them at all? Will, will they come to us asking for questions? We would like to be able to guide any person who expresses interest and commits their life to you. We would like to be able to guide them into being a Christian, into be, becoming more like you. And we want to be used by you to actually help people to overcome and be healed from the sin problem, to point them to you that they could trust that they can actually be healed, that they can be converted and to be saved. So please help us in these things, and please continue to spend time with us throughout the remainder of the hours that we're here for the Sabbath. We appreciate the time that we can spend here. And we pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.